Welcome to Justice Trek. My name is Ted Kilvington, and this is an audio and video log that journeys through comic book history as I discuss individual comic book stories of Star Trek, the Justice Society, and the world's greatest superheroes, the Justice League of America. Justice Trek is the only show devoted to the entirety of these great comic book series. From the 1940 debut of the JSA, the launch of the JLA and Star Trek comic books in the 1960s, and right up to comics hot off today's shelves. This show will impact you in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1... Welcome to Justice Trek. My name is Ted Killington. Thank you very much for joining me. This is episode 9.1. It is a Crisis Trek episode where I will discuss 1978's showcase number 100. Why 9.1, do you ask? Well, as I was preparing for this episode, I just kept uh, coming up with more and more ideas, more great things I wanted to uh, share with you. So I decided for, um, uh, for the sake of your time constraints and for the, uh, well, for the sake of the file size constraints uh, that I would break this up into two separate parts. Uh, so in the crisis trek, uh, it's basically where I'm gonna journey through DC Comics history to discuss the uh, publication and narrative background leading up to the 1985 uh, comic book crossover event, Crisis on Infinite Earths. Now, uh, Crisis on Infinite Earths, um, at me, as a child of the Bronze Age, I turned uh, 17 in the middle of the crisis. Uh, and it, was, it ended my senior year of high school, and so just a few months after it ended, I, I graduated from high school, so um, not only was it the end of uh, a comic book era, it was also the end of an era of my life. So, Definitely it played a big part in my uh, comic book uh, hobby collecting experience. Um, before I go any further, just want to remind you, uh, we have many previous episodes for you to uh, enjoy. There are uh, two episodes available audio only on uh, thejusticetrek.podbean.com. Those are episode one, where I covered uh, JLA number 137 from 1976, uh, and episode eight, our most recent episode where I covered uh, 1980s, uh, The Brave and the Bold number one, or, uh, sorry, 2007's The Brave and the Bold number nine as part of the JL May uh, podcast crossover event. Now, um, all of my episodes will be available on YouTube uh, for eternity, I guess. I don't know how long YouTube will keep them up. Certainly, if you keep watching, they'll keep them on, available online. So uh, um, please enjoy. Um, so the crisis event uh, kind of evolved over a couple decades, uh, kind of spinning out of the uh, annual Justice League of America, Justice Society of America team-ups. Uh, now, I, I'm a huge JLA, JSA fan. You know, in episode uh, three, I covered the first appearance of the Justice Society. In episode five, I covered the first appearance of the Justice League. Um, and now I'm going to talk a bit about their, their history of teaming up. The first team up was in 1963, and JLA number 21, Crisis on Earth 1, and JLA number 22, Crisis on Earth 2. Uh, then in 1964, uh, we had JLA number 29, Crisis on Earth 3, uh, where they introduced the evil uh, versions of Superman, Batman, uh, Wonder Woman, Green Lantern, and Flash. Those were uh, Ultraman, Owlman, Superwoman, Power Ring, and Johnny Quick from Earth-3 as members of what they called the Crime Syndicate of America. Then uh, the second part of that year's team-up, JLA number 30, the most dangerous Earth of all. Not all of the story titles will ha contain the word crisis, although at least half of them do. So crisis was definitely a big part. Uh, 1965, uh, we had um, JLA number 37, Earth Without a Justice League. Uh, and then JLA number 38, 
Crisis on Earth A. Now, in that year's team up, they um, uh, fought uh, the basically the evil Johnny Thunder from Earth One. Got obtained power over the uh, magical genie that belonged to the Johnny Thunder of Earth Two, and then the evil Johnny Thunder from Earth One um, created an alternate timeline because he undid all of the origins of the Justice League, and in this alternate timeline. They, it was basically called or Earth A for Earth Alternate. So it wasn't actually a parallel Earth. It was an alternate Earth. Uh, that was the only time DC really went that route with the team-ups. Um, of course, there have been plenty of other alternate timeline stories, but uh, uh, that was another reason why DC wanted to do the crisis, was not only to clear up confusion among alternate or parallel uh, Earths, but... The uh, also to deal with some of the alternate timelines that DC had. Uh, the next year, 1966, uh, we had JLA number 46, Crisis Between Earth 1 and Earth 2. So it was in the limbo between the Earths. Uh, and that concept, the limbo between the Earths, uh, also has played a big part in uh, future DC stories. Um, and then um, the, the number 47 was uh, the bridge between Earths. Uh, in JLA uh, number 55 from 1967, we had the super crisis that struck Earth 2, and number 56, the negative crisis on Earths 1 2. 1968, we had uh, it was actually the, the last Gardner Fox written uh, Justice League story, and by um, uh, logic, it's also the last JLA JSA team up he ever wrote. Uh, and also, it's the first year that they didn't include the word crisis in the story titles. Uh, the number 64, the stormy return of the Red Tornado, which was a misnomer because the original Red Tornado from the first uh, appearance of the Justice Society um, didn't return. It was actually the introduction of the new Red Tornado, the Android version. And then the uh, second part of that was uh, T.O. Morrow kills the Justice League today. Now, T.O. Morrow, it's, on, it's spelled like almost like tomorrow, but it's the name of the uh, scientist supervillain Thomas Oscar, or T.O., last name Morrow. 1969, jailing number 73, Starlight, Starbright, Death Star, I See Tonight. And number 74, Where Death Fears to tread. Now, this was a very epochal story, folks. Uh, this is certainly um, the first JLA JSA team up that had immediate continuity uh, impacts upon uh, DC storytelling. Uh, what had happened is um, in 1968, DC had decided that um, uh, the Wonder Woman comic wasn't doing well as a superhero. So they decided because uh, Spy. Uh, movies and spy TV shows were really popular in the 60s. So they thought, well, we can't make sell Wonder Woman as a superhero comic. Maybe we can sell her as a spy comic. So they took away her superpowers, uh, had her switch from her uh, traditional costume into a white jumpsuit, um, and basically made her a, like a super spy. Uh, and because she was no longer a superhero, she couldn't be in the Justice League. Uh, writer Denny O'Neill, who in an interview in Amazing World of DC Comics, said... Uh, that he felt he, they needed a female presence on the team. Uh, and he, but he didn't want to create a new character. And, and he wanted the character that had established DC history. Um, he also didn't want a female uh, superhero who was merely a derivative version of a male superhero. So no Batgirl, no Hawkgirl, no uh, like Mira Aquaman's wife would, wouldn't be available. So there really actually weren't that many uh, standalone superheroines in DC Comics in 1969. So he took uh, one that had made several appearances in uh, the JLA, which was the Black Canary from the JSA. So in number 74, which just happens to be the oldest Justice League comic I own an original copy of, in that issue, writer Denny O'Neill killed off Larry Lance, uh, and then had uh, Black Canary uh, grieve uh, so much over the passing of her husband that she decided to switch from Earth 2 to Earth 1 and join the Justice League. 
or did she? We'll get into this in future episodes because this will be a big part uh, of the lead up to uh, the crisis on infinite earth. But uh, suffice it to say that uh, uh, by the time crisis rolled around, well, the way we thought uh, events had transpired in JLA number 74, uh, well, they later told us that uh, what we thought was wrong. In 1970, we had JLA number 82, Peril of the Paired Planets, and JLA number 83, where Valor, <laughs> where Valor fails, will magic triumph. Uh, 1971, Jailing number 91, Earth the Monster Maker, and Jailing number 92, Solomon Grundy, the one and only. By the way, there have been many Solomon Grundys over the years. Uh, they even did one story where there was like two dozen of them in one single story. Um, now, by 1972, uh, the uh, JLA Archive series um, had uh, published up to issue 93, um, so I do own all of the original individual Justice League comics, uh, from issue 90 through four up to, uh, the present. Um, there are a few of the, uh, like animated universe ones that I don't have, uh, and a couple of the Elseworlds, but certainly all of the, the main universe continuity Justice Leagues, I have originals of all of the individual issues from number 94 on forward. Uh, 1972, uh, was the first three-part team-up. It was the first um, written by writer Len Wang. It was the first time that they introduced a third super team to uh, the JLA JSA team-ups. So that year we had JLA number 100, The Unknown Soldier of Victory. We had uh, JLA number 101, The Hand That Shook the World, and JLA number 102, And One of Us Must Die. Now, in 1973, uh, we had the reintroduction of the uh, quality comics characters. Uh, there was a separate comic book company in the 1940s called Quality Comics. They kept publishing from uh, circa 1939 up through uh, 1956. But then they got out of the comics game, sold off uh, all of their uh, intellectual property to DC Comics. Uh, DC uh, did continue publishing um, a couple of their titles, such as Black Hawk, which we covered extensively in issue number seven. Uh, and they also uh, took over, um, uh, published uh, G.I. Combat, uh, Robin Hood, and I think there was a romance title that they kept publishing. Um, but otherwise, all of the quality comics uh, characters uh, had lapsed from 1956 up until the 1973 team up. Um, this is the one where um, they said, writer Len Wayne said that the uh, parallel Earth of the Freedom Fighters, the quality characters, uh, was taken over by the Nazis who won World War II. This world was called, daily number 107, Crisis on Earth X. Earth X was not the name Len Wayne wanted to use. Uh, what I read was that he wanted to, since it was a Nazi Earth, he wanted to say, have it be Earth Swastika. But editor Julius Schwartz um, was uh, Jewish, uh, and um, he obviously was a huge opponent uh, in every way possible of the Nazi regime. And he said there's no way there was going to be an Earth swastika in a book he edited. So they changed it to Earth X. Um, but they still had Nazis, and of course the heroes defeated the Nazis. Uh, in issue 108... We had uh, 13 against the Earth. Now, one of the things I like about this cover is, of course, they're fighting on Earth X. And the positions of the, um, the triangles on the cover, the, the yellow and orange backgrounds, uh, and the positions of the heroes as they rush in to battle each other, it, it forms a giant X, or Earth X. Now, by 1974, uh, DC uh, had converted the Justice League of America to a 100-page super spectacular. Uh, because they were, uh, the issues were so large, even though um, there was only 20 pages of news story and the rest 
well, reprints. Uh, this is one of my cats, folks. Uh, they get jealous sometimes when I talk uh, to you. Um, so they try and get my attention. But um, just remember, folks, they're, they're just cats. And they're jealous of you because you have my attention and they want it. Anywho, 1974, uh, they decided, because of the size of the Justice League at that time, to make it a bi-monthly book, uh, which meant every other month. Therefore, they decided that year they would only do one part to the JLA-JSA team-up. That was also written by Len Wayne, his last uh, uh, JLA-JSA story he would write, and that was JLA number 113, The Creature in the Velvet Cage. Okay, now in 1975, we had JLA number 123, Where on Earth Am I? And number 124, The Avenging Ghosts of the Justice Society. Now, this year's, uh, 1975's uh, JLA JSA team up um, also was one that would presage future events. In this year, uh, they fought the menace of the members of the Injustice Society, such as the Wizard. Um, but they also fought two of the most unusual, actually, well, one of the most unusual, uh, I should say, uh, characters they've ever encountered. And that was comic book writer Carrie Bates, uh, who had traveled from the world of Earth Prime. Now, in the pages of The Flash, DC had established that there was a, another parallel Earth called Earth Prime. Supposedly, that was the world that we lived on, the real world. Uh, and when they would travel to Earth Prime, they would often meet uh, many of the uh, people who worked for DC Comics. Since the DC Comics uh, staff, well, they knew who, they knew about the Justice League. They knew about Flash and such. In this story, um, writers Carrie Bates and Elliot Magan uh, managed to travel from Earth Prime to uh, the worlds of the Justice League and Justice Society. However, somehow uh, Carrie Bates um, got uh, twisted and became evil and started working with the Injustice Society. And now because he and Elliot Magan were writers, well, writers write the stories. So he was influencing the events of the story. So was writer Elliot Magan, uh, which made the resolution. Uh, 1976, we had another three-part uh, JLA JSA team up, and this time uh, they brought back the uh, Fawcett comics characters. Uh, now this was a little different from the quality characters. Uh, Fawcett, like quality, uh, began in uh, 1939, published comics up through the mid 50s, uh, then stopped. But they didn't sell their assets to DC. Uh, over the course of the next 15 or so years. Um, they let their intellectual property languish. Uh, their most prominent character was the original Captain Marvel, Shazam. Uh, and in the meantime, both uh, like uh, Myron Fast Publications uh, and uh, the uh, Marvel Comics had come out with characters named Captain Marvel. So, so Fawcett realized that in order to protect their intellectual property, they needed to uh, have them uh, appear uh, again, they needed to, but by that point, the copyright had lapsed and because other characters, other publishers were using the name Captain Marvel. So DC no longer had any exclusive rights to the name. So that's why at that point in the 70s, when they fi finally, when Fawcett licensed the, their superhero characters to DC, they, and DC started publishing them, they called uh, that book Shazam after the word that uh, young Billy Batson young Billy Batson used to change into uh, Captain Marvel. So, uh, but we could talk about Captain Litigant all night. If you'd like to hear more about this year's 1976's uh, team up, uh, certainly the final issue, check out episode one of Justice Trek, where I went into great detail, not only about the comic itself, but how much I love that comic and how it inspired me to become the comic collector I am today. Uh, you can credit it 
or you can blame it. I credit it, my wife blames it. Um, potato, potato. Anywho, 1976, we have JLA number 135, Crisis in Eternity. We're back to crisis story title, folks. JLA number 136, Crisis on Earth S. And JLA number 137, Crisis in Tomorrow. Nineteen seventy-seven. That year, they, uh, the Justice League and Justice Society teamed up with another team. This time, the Legion of Superheroes. Number one forty-seven, Crisis in the Thirtieth Century, and number one forty-eight, Crisis in Triplicate. Okay, that brings us up to the time of. Uh, showcase number 100. Now, this comic has never been reprinted. It is not available digitally. If you want to read the story, you're either going to have to find a library that has a copy available for reading, or you're going to have to crack down and probably purchase a copy of your own. I did own this comic in 1978. However, I was nine years old at the time and it didn't survive uh, into my teen years. So this is a copy I bought later, it's a back issue. But um, I did love it at the time. Um, this was what probably, certainly among probably one of the first 10 comics I ever bought. Um, and uh, it was, I think it was just, just a wonderful introduction to so many great DC characters. Um, let's see. Now, before I, I get in more into showcase number 100 specifically, remember we're here to talk about not just that one comic, but also about the, our trek through DC history as we get to Crisis on Infinite Earths, our crisis trek. So, uh, other comics that would be published in 1978, or at least with a 1978 cover date, that would, um, uh, have some influence on events as they led up to uh, the crisis. Those comics are JLA number 153, which featured the introduction of a brand new Earth Prime superhero. So remember, Earth Prime supposedly is the real world, and now the real world has a superhero. Well, if you weren't alive in 1978, uh, you may not be familiar with um, the news, uh, of that time. So let me uh, spoil it for you. There were no superheroes in the real world. <laughs> Basically, in this issue, um, the Justice League travel to uh, the parallel world of Earth Prime, where they meet up with editor Julia Schwartz, but somehow their activities on that planet uh, lead to the creation of that world's uh, first superhero, Ultra, and the world's first uh, supervillain, Maxitron. They defeat Maxitron, but supposedly the presence of the superheroes created the presence of supervillains. So not only did the Justice League return to Earth-1, so too did Ultra. Now you pronounce it Ultra because it's spelled like the word Ultra, but with an extra A. So it goes from Ultra to Ultra. At least that's how I pronounce it. You may choose to pronounce it differently. I've never actually seen any official pronunciation guide from DC. Uh, there's an idea for a future publishing event, uh, Crisis on Infinite Pronunciations. Uh, also in 1978, another parallel Earth story is Batman Family number 17. This is where the Huntress, which is the daughter of the Batman and Catwoman from Earth 2, the Huntress, who had just been introduced a couple months uh, previously in the pages of DC Superstars and All-Star Comics, uh, the Huntress traveled from Earth-2 to, to Earth-1 uh, to uh, meet up with the Batman of Earth-1 to get some tips about crime fighting. So it used to be that we would only see a lot of the parallel uh, world stories, uh, sometimes in the pages of uh, Flash, uh, or, uh, or, or sometimes where the characters uh, would team up with their parallel Earth 
counterparts. So you might see a story where the Flash of Earth 1 and Earth 2 got together, or Green Lantern of Earth 1 and Earth 2, or Adam of Earth 1 and Earth 2, uh, or of course the JLA and JSA. But now we're getting past that, and we're really getting a lot more into um, parallel Earth meetings. Another one published around that time was World's Finest Comics number 250, The Reality War. Uh, now, this comic, uh, like uh, all the Justice League comics in 1978 and uh, many others, were uh, written by writer Jerry Conway. Um, now, uh, The Reality War, with a 56-page story, uh, was also like um, uh, JLA 153, penciled by George Tosca. Uh, and this had uh, Earth-1 characters, uh, Superman, Batman, uh, Green Arrow, uh, Black Canary, and the Earth-2 character, the Wonder Woman of 1942. Um, now, for those of you who don't recall, in the mid-1970s, uh, they uh, started pub or publishing, they started uh, broadcasting a television program based on the DC comic character Wonder Woman. The first season of that show was set during World War II. So to tie in the Wonder Woman comic to the Wonder Woman TV show, um, DC at that time said all of the solo stories of Wonder Woman would now be about the World War II adventures of the Wonder Woman of Earth Two. Well, after one season, uh, it was, uh, kind of cost prohibitive to uh, film all of those period pieces. So uh, the producers of the show decided that they were going to bring Wonder Woman uh, into modern times. So uh, this is actually uh, the second to last uh, Wonder Woman of Earth to uh, World War II story told in the 70s. Uh, the last one was the one where they had a, a transition back to the modern time where she met the Wonder Woman of Earth 1 of the present. Um, but again, so this time it not only uh, involved multiple Earths, it involved different times. Again, uh, this was a, where a lot of the, the build-up to crisis would happen, because we weren't just crossing through uh, parallel worlds. We were now doing uh, time travel and alternate timelines. Reality was at war. <laughs> A couple more Justice League stories. Uh, oh, before I get into that, sorry. Um, another parallel Earth story that year, outside of the Justice League, uh, was all new collector's edition number C56, where um, Superman and Captain Marvel met once again, this time uh, as opposed to the um, uh, so called fight they had in number 137, Galen 137 where they didn't actually lay a punch on each other. This time, several punches are thrown. And uh, not only uh, are, do we have those two characters, we have uh, uh, Superman's cousin Supergirl, uh, Captain Marvel's sister Mary Marvel. Uh, we also have um, the villain uh, Carmang. Um, we have the villain uh, Cormer, also known as the Sand Superman. And we have the villain Black Adam, star of the, the great big silver screen. Uh, this is actually Black Adam's third appearance ever. So uh, in Justice League number 157, uh, we have the uh, wedding of the Adam and Gene Loring. Uh, this really wouldn't be uh, so much a crisis issue, but certainly would uh, play up uh, Adam's relationship with Gene Loring um, was uh, not part of the Crisis on Infinite Earths, but it was part of the 2003 crossover event, Identity Crisis. Uh, one issue later, we have another appearance of Ultra, where we see what he's up to on Earth-1. Basically, in this issue, um, we, he tries to, um, since superheroes were causing damage on uh, his world, um, our world, um, he thought he should eliminate superheroes on Earth-1 as well. Well, um, naturally, if you only eliminate the, the powers of the superheroes, uh, then the supervillains will take advantage. And they did. Uh, 
Uh, next up, we have that year's 1978 JLA-JSA team-up. Uh, we're using the crisis titles now. So we have number 159, Crisis from Yesterday. Now remember the previous year, they uh, teamed up with the heroes from the future, the Legion of Superheroes. Uh, now they're fighting uh, some well, more or less random characters from DC of the past. They weren't even superheroes. Uh, we have uh, the Western uh, uh, character, Jonah Hex, the World War I uh, German fighter pilot uh, known as the Enemy Ace, uh, we have the um, Viking Prince from uh, early issues of The Brave and the Bold. Uh, we have uh, Miss Liberty, who never even had her own feature, but she was just a supporting character in uh, DC's Revolutionary War series, Tomahawk. Uh, and we have uh, the Black Pirate, who was a, a pirate, uh, a masked pirate in the, um, I think it was the 1600s, um, and his stories were uh, published in the 40s. One other comic, uh, one other Justice League comic that came out at that time, uh, Justice League of America number 161, December, cover date, 1978. This was the issue where Zatanna finally joins the Justice League. They've been talking about her joining ever since she first appeared um, in a, uh, not really a, a crossover event per se, but they, it was several uh, connected stories. Basically, Zatanna would appear like in Hawkman and ask, you know, and deal with him. And then she'd appear in uh, like Green Lantern and then uh, the, the Adams book. Um, appear, met Batman and she met the Elongated Man. And then finally, all she and all five of those characters got together in an issue of Justice League. Uh, but ever since that issue of Justice League, which I think was issue 51, um, there was talk about Zatanna joining the team. And finally, it happened. 110 issues later. Apparently, Satana didn't have enough of a reputation uh, that uh, writer Denny O'Neill thought she could replace Wonder Woman back in the late 60s. Um, now, there's another uh, comic around that time that will definitely uh, have an impact on uh, DC's interaction with Parallel Earths. And that was Wonder Woman number 248, featuring the second death of Steve Trevor. Now, long story short, in the 60s, when they decided to make Wonder Woman a super spy, they killed off Steve Trevor. Uh, in the mid-70s, when they brought her back to being a superhero, uh, eventually they said, well, let's bring Steve Trevor back. I don't actually recall. I don't have all of those uh, comics from the Wonder Woman comics from the 70s. So I don't recall how exactly they explained um, him uh, returning to life. However, just a couple years later, he was dead again. And yes, I won't tell you uh, too much now, but that will have future implications on parallel Earths. Now, one other thing around this time. I don't know if you, you probably couldn't see the price tags on these comics or the cover prices on these 1978 comics, but they started out at 60 cents and then went to 50 cents and then went to 40 cents. You might think, hey, uh, you know, lower prices, great deal, huh? Um, well, not really. Um, inflation was even worse in the late 70s when it is now, but the reason why prices were going down is because DC couldn't afford to publish so many different uh, formats. So... Uh, from uh, roughly JLA number uh, 139 through 157, uh, they uh, were 48-page uh, uh, comics with 34 pages of story and the rest being ads and text pieces and such. Um, but then they decided as part of the DC explosion they wanted to um, create a new publishing format that would give more story pages to readers and more value to retailers. So they increased the price of their regular comics to 35 cents and they reduced the price of their 60 cent comics to 50 cents and then it made them all 40 page comics with 25 pages of story and art. DC was also attempting to launch a lot of new titles and the extra story pages would result in uh, additional story space that could be used to have additional features, both of old 
old characters are returning to, to have their own uh, story features again, and uh, brand new characters. Well, the DC Explosion launched at the beginning of June 1978 and um, lasted two weeks. On, at the end, uh, DC's uh, corporate uh, overseers at Warner Communications said, um, yeah, due to the severe financial stress of the company, all uh, subsidiaries must downsize. You need to uh, drastically scale back your operations. So DC uh, canceled almost half of their titles in what was known as the DC Implosion. So with the DC Implosion, um, you know, almost half their titles were canceled and they reduced the uh, extra pages uh, so comics went back to the standard 32 cent size. Only now they were 40 cent cover price, whereas previously um, they had been uh, 35 cent. Uh, now that, that's also a common uh, uh, marketing tactic where you slightly raise the price and then you lower it a little bit uh, so that people think they're, well, it's price is down 10 cents. That's a good deal. Yeah, but it's still a nickel more than it was three months ago. But um, one of the consequences is in preparation for the DC explosion, DC had a lot of extra uh, material that they had written and drawn for intending to be published. And so one of the reasons they actually had to lay off a lot of staff because uh, they had some people, you know, the, their key people that they wanted to keep, but th there were other people that uh, they, with all this backlog of stories that they'd already purchased and paid for and had written and drawn, they wanted to use that material rather than pay people to do even more stories. I mean, basically they had more uh, stories, uh, more uh, written, more stories written and drawn than they had pages to print them in. So over the next year or so, um, they would find places in different publications to print a lot of these stories. Uh, you may recall the infamous uh, canceled comics cavalcade, uh, which uh, they for uh, they made it where well, they took a lot of these uh, canceled comics that had already been written and drawn, and uh, literally made Xerox copies, like maybe I don't know uh, fifty uh, copies of all these comics and stapled them together and said, uh, "Okay, well here this is now a, a comic called Canceled Comics Cavalcade." And they just distributed amongst themselves. That way they could claim that they were being published and that way they would secure their copyrights, trademarks, or whatever the legal situation was. So that was DC Comics and that was Crisis Comics in 1978. So now I'm going to air the credits. When we come back, we're going to talk even more about showcase number 100. Stick around. It'll be good. If you have questions or comments, please feel free to send them to me on Twitter under the handle at Justice Trek or via email at thejusticetrek at gmail.com. Be sure to include the word the at the beginning of the email address. For research purposes, I rely heavily on dc.fandom.com memory-alpha.fandom.com comicvine.gamespot.com the Grand Comics Database at comics.org and Mike Boyle's website Mike's Amazing World of DC Comics at dcindexes.com The opinions expressed are solely those of the host and any participants. This podcast is not a commercial enterprise and does not make any money. All copyrights are held by their respective owners. The opening sequence was animated by Craig Smith of Phoenix Studios. The opening music is Dragon Slayer by the Mackay Symphony. All music used is either public domain and or not protected by copyright. Under Section 107 of the Copyright Act of 1976, allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comments, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational, or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use. Okay, folks, got a bit of a change of plans. Originally, I was going to do showcase number 100 all in one episode, but then 
I didn't get talking and writing and more and more ideas. So I said, well, I'm going to have to break this up into two parts. Uh, we, you know, for file size reasons. And so you wouldn't have to listen to such a long thing in one setting. Um, however, in the course of doing what I thought was going to be part one, it, it just went on and on. I had so much great stuff to talk to you about. I, I mean, I hope you've enjoyed what you've already listened to. So the, the new plan is the uh, crisis trek portion where i talk about the history of uh the crisis themes and the jla jsa team ups um and uh, what's going on that's building up to the crisis on infinite earth in the year 1978 uh, that'll be p p the new part one the second part one will be the extended roll call that i went on i find that kind of information fascinating hopefully you'll find my presentation of that information to be fascinating so what you just listened to was part one. Now I'm going to do the roll call and that'll be part two. And then of course, after the roll call, we'll do part three where I do the uh, story synopsis and my notes on it. Unless that goes super long, I don't think it will, but if it does, then we'll have to do a part four. Let's cross our fingers that we <laughs> can get through this in three parts. And not four. So <sighs> click like, click subscribe, stay tuned for part two, and keep on Justice Trekkin'.